to um, Dr. Carson. He's the Emeritus Professor of Neurosurgery. He's going to tell you, kind of start off with a little introduction, and then we're going to go right into asking questions. So take it away. Well, hello, everyone. We're delighted to, that you're with us today. Uh, we're here in sunny Florida, where it's probably about 78 degrees. But don't let that make you feel bad, because snow is pretty. But uh, at any rate, uh, when I was a youngster, one of the things that I vividly remember uh, after my parents got divorced was dire poverty. There was never money for anything. I remember we used to have something called popcorn balls, and uh, the teacher would say, everybody bring a nickel tomorrow because we're going to be selling popcorn balls. I never had a popcorn ball. We never had an extra nickel. Uh, as they look so good. Now I realize they probably weren't any better than anything else, but when you can't have something, it looks so much better. But uh, I just hated being poor. But then I started reading a lot. My mother made me start reading books because I was doing so poorly in school. And uh, you had to read the books. So I really didn't have any choice. And I wasn't very enthusiastic about it at first, but as I started reading about people, of accomplishment, it really began to affect me. And the more people I read about, the more I realized that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. It's not somebody else. It's not the environment. And I started realizing that I could control my own future. And at that point, poverty didn't bother me anymore because I knew it was temporary. I knew that I could change it. Nothing is that bad if you know you don't have to endure it for very long. So that made all the difference in the world for me. And also learning to think for myself. I stopped listening to all the people around me who were saying, eh, you can't do that, or the system's against you, or those people are against you. And, you know, I just said, hey, I have better things to do with my time than to listen to that garbage. And, uh, and that made such a big difference because I started getting involved in all kinds of things around me. I started going back to school, after school, to talk to the teachers because a lot of the times they didn't get to teach because they spent the whole hour disciplining people. So I would go back after school and I'd say, what were you planning on teaching today? And they were delighted to see me come back because they knew that their uh, work would not go in vain. And uh, I was able to get everything that I needed, even though I was in a, in a terrible environment, to be able to move on to Yale University. So the, the key point that I want you to take away from that is that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. Just keep that in mind. Don't let anybody else convince you that you're a victim. Okay, let's go ahead with our uh, Whitewater Middle School for year two questions. What do I do? Okay, ask your first ask. Um, like, what made you want to work with other people? You could have done any job to benefit yourself. Like, why did you want to help other people? It was really the only thing that, that ever interested me a whole lot. Even as a small child, I was always interested in anything that came on television or the radio about medicine because these doctors, particularly the missionary doctors, would go all over the world uh, to help people, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually, and they just seemed to me like the most noble people on the face of the earth. And I've always gravitated in, in that direction. And uh, you know, even as an adult, when we started our scholar recognition program, which is in all 50 states, by the way, now, in order for students to win, they not only have to be superb academically, but they have to demonstrate humanitarian qualities, that they care about other people. Because, you know, it really doesn't do that much good to be super smart if you don't care about anybody but yourself. That's called selfishness. And there's way too much of that. And we all need to start figuring out ways that we can really be helpful to those around us. That's what real success is all about. You know, I, I live in an area where there are a lot of extraordinarily rich people, but not as many 
really successful people. There's a difference. Successful people are those who utilize the talents that God has given them to elevate other people. That's my definition of success. Uh, did, did the price of college ever discourage you to, with becoming a doctor? The cost of education today is very, very significant. Uh, in many colleges and universities around the country, you're talking fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. But of course, there are many alternatives. There are state schools, uh, there are community colleges, where the cost is much less, can be one tenth or even less of what it would cost to go to a very expensive university. So you have to look at all the various options. Also recognize that scholarships exist. For instance, uh, if you were a super student and you got accepted at Yale or Harvard or any of the Ivy League schools, they have a special policy whereby if you can get in, they will make sure that you have the finances that are necessary to complete it. So you can't necessarily always just look at the cost. You also have to look at what are the mechanisms for paying for it. And some colleges and universities have very robust financial aid uh, departments, and they're willing to help tremendously. Uh, and in some cases, you actually may have to, to work. You may have to work your way through. You may have to save up enough money uh, and then go to school for a couple of years and then save up some more money and go to school for another couple of years. But when you get all done, you've increased your earning power significantly. So the fact that you've gone into the hole for 10, 15, 20, 25, $30,000, you're gonna make that up in almost no time compared to what you would be making if you didn't have the kind of training that would allow you to move on. Now, another thing I want you to think about, uh, no matter what you decide to major in when you go to college, it's important to make sure that you're versatile. I was talking to the chairman of Intel. He said, we have a lot of jobs that pay a lot of money, but we do not have enough American college graduates to fill those positions. So we have to go to China and Japan and India, Singapore and South Korea and all these places to get people to fill these high paying jobs because they're the ones who are technically proficient. And we have a lot of people in this country who graduate from college with degrees in political science, international studies and philosophy and psychology, but they don't have a lot of technical knowledge. So they can't fill those kinds of jobs. So what I would recommend to you when you go to college, even if you decide I want to be a diplomat, you know, I want to do international studies, that's fine. But it doesn't mean that you can't take some calculus courses or some biology or chemistry courses or, you know, trigonometry or computer science. Make yourself technologically capable and it gives you a lot more options. They say that the average college graduate today will have somewhere between three and five careers before they retire. Those who have flexibility because they are knowledgeable in lots of areas will do much better. You get to determine your own value. And the other thing I want you to remember, the average person in America today lives to be about 80 years old. The first 20 to 25 years you spent either preparing yourself or not preparing yourself. If you prepare yourself, you have 60 years to reap the benefits. If you don't prepare yourself, you have 60 years to suffer the consequences. But you get to make the decision. Thanks, Whitewater Middle School. Let's move on to Wal uh, Walnut Creek Elementary School for your two questions. Hi, my name is Judith, and I'm from Walnut Creek Elementary School. And my question for you is, how did you feel when you were finished with the German Twins? Well, I felt tired, because uh, 
It was a 22-hour operation. In fact, I was sitting in my office with one of the other neurosurgeons discussing the case, and we both fell asleep in mid-sentence and woke up three hours later. So we were pretty exhausted. But uh, it, was, it was an exhilarating feeling to know that, you know, all of that time, that effort, that preparation uh, had worked. And we had two separate individuals that were still alive. And that had never happened before. So it was exhilarating. But I have to tell you, I'm just as exhilarated when I do a simple operation. Because for that patient, that's a life-saving, quality of life saving procedure. And every one of them is just as important. Some don't gather a lot of media attention, but it doesn't mean that it's not just as important. And really, no matter what you do, no matter what your career is, just remember that you're having an impact on more than just yourself and try to do it extremely well. Hi, I'm Daisy and I'm from Walnut Creek. My question is, did you learn anything besides ne neuro brain surgery? Yes, <laughs> I learned a lot more uh, than just brain surgery. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons that you know, I sit on Fortune 500 corporate boards because I learned a lot about business. Uh, that's, that's the reason I, I do a lot of international travel and dealing with, with all kinds of matters that have nothing to do with medicine. Uh, for some strange reason, people tend to think that doctors only know about medicine. And that's absolutely false. There were five doctors who signed the Declaration of Independence. Doctors signed the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights. There's no reason that doctors and scientists have to be unidimensional or only know one thing. And it's, I find it kind of amusing that people never seem to ask those questions of lawyers. They seem to think that they're supposed to know everything, but doctors are only supposed to know about medicine. Completely not true. And uh, whatever you decide to pursue, you may decide to be a, an engineer or a school teacher or a businessman. It doesn't matter. You know, broaden your horizons. Make sure you know as much as you possibly can. The people who founded our nation said that our system of government is based upon a well-informed and educated populace. And they said, if the people ever become not informed and not well educated, then the nature of the country will change. Why did they say that? Because they knew that people wouldn't be able to analyze anything if they weren't well educated. And it makes all the difference in the world. So don't listen to those people who tell you that you don't need to know this or that or the other or that you can just look it up on your iPhone. Do not listen to them. Because if I tell you something right now, you're processing that information based on what's already up here, not based on what's on your iPhone. So you have to have the information there so that you can screen it and process it immediately when it comes in. Otherwise, you wouldn't know whether I'm telling you a fib or whether I'm telling you the truth. And I always say, knowledge is power. And a very knowledgeable individual is a formidable foe for falsehood and a formidable ally for truth. You, again, get to make that decision. Okay, thank you, Walnut Creek. Let's go to St. Killian's for your two questions, please. How do you mentally prepare yourself for a surgery? Okay. Well, I think that the most important thing is to make sure you understand what your goals are. What is it that you want to accomplish so that you know what the options are for accomplishing it and you also know when you have accomplished it. You know, sometimes you've probably heard the saying, uh, better is the enemy of good. 
And that means that sometimes you will have accomplished what you're trying to do, and then you try to do it better and you mess it up. Uh, you have to really know when you've, when you've reached the point that you're trying to reach. And those are the kinds of things you think about mentally. You know, I myself always pray for wisdom also. And, uh, and just contemplate. Uh, sometimes I try to visualize what it is that I want to do. Uh, and you have to really do that, especially um, vigorously, when you're in a teaching hospital, because you have to teach other people how to do things. And it's much easier to do it yourself than to teach somebody else to do it. It's just like flying a jet plane. You know, it's easy for a jet pilot, but when you have to turn the control over to somebody else and you're sitting there, you say, oh my gosh, I hope they learned. Um, so, you know, that's something that you just have to keep in mind. Um, and also make sure that you understand your responsibility. You know, people are putting in your hands the most valuable thing they have, which is their life. There's nothing that you have that's more important than your life. I remember as an intern, I would go onto the floors of the hospital at Johns Hopkins, and I would see these very important people, the CEO of this corporation, the president of this organization, crown prince, queen of this nation, many of them dying of some horrible disease. And every single one of them would have gladly given every penny and every title for a clean bill of health. You begin to realize how valuable your health is. If, if you woke up tomorrow morning and found out that you had just inherited five billion dollars, it'd say, wow, this is great. But then in the next sentence, you found out that you were going to die later that day. Wouldn't help very much, would it? And you'd probably be happy to trade that $5 billion for a full life. Just something to think about. What is your greatest accomplishment? There's been a lot of accomplishments. Uh, you know, certainly being a father and raising three sons uh, who are successful. They've all grown up. They're married. They're good providers. They have excellent jobs. And, uh, and they love their fellow man. And I think that's incredibly important. I also am extraordinarily pleased about the Carson Scholars Fund, uh, which is in all 50 states. And we have so many thousands of young people across this country who are serving as excellent role models for others, showing them what they can accomplish and we're putting in reading rooms all over the nation, uh, particularly in Title I schools where a lot of the kids come from homes with no books, and go to schools with no libraries. They're the ones who drop out. 30% of people who enter high school in this country do not graduate. We cannot afford that. And by putting these fascinating reading rooms in that almost no little kid would pass up, you know, they begin to develop a love for reading. And if a person can read, they're very likely to be successful. When uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, and some of you will read about him in your history classes, he came to America back in 1831 to study this nation because the Europeans could not believe what was going on in this country. They said, those Americans are something. They're, their, their country is only 50 years old, but they're already competing with us on virtually every level. That's impossible. How can a fledgling nation do that? And he wanted to figure out what was going on in America. One of the things he discovered is that it was a very literate society. Anybody finishing the second grade was completely literate. They could read the newspaper. They could have a political discussion, tell them how the government worked. You only found that with the aristocracy in Europe. And it was really one of the things that led this country to go forward so quickly and reach the pinnacle of the world so quickly, that education. 
And that's why I emphasize it so greatly. Thank you, St. Killians. Let's go ahead and move on to Believers Fellowship Academy. Please remember to mute your systems when you're not asking a question. Thank you. If Miranda Francisco had survived, how would you, how would that have affected your career? And what do you still remember of this little girl? If she had not survived, how would that have affected me? Was that the question? Yes, that was her question. Uh, well, you know, it's a hypothetical, so we never know. But I will tell you that there have been patients that I have lost. Uh, fortunately, not very many. But you learn to move on. You do the very best that you can. But you have to recognize that you are not ultimately in control. God is ultimately in control. So in my case, he gets the credit, but he also gets the blame because he's in control. I'm not in control. What I am in control of is what I can do and doing the very best that I can do. And that's, that's what I strongly recommend uh, to all of you. Uh, and there's some people who are what I call worry warts. And they sit around and they worry about everything. I haven't seen any situations where worrying helps, to be honest with you. All it does is create stress in your life, makes you less effective, uh, makes your thinking less clear, and none of that is really necessary. Keep your life moving in the right direction, understand what your goals are, be honest. That's a, that's a big one in terms of having clarity in your life. Don't put a lot of skeletons in the closet because they always come back to haunt you just when you don't want to see them. Being a surgeon requires taking risks. Is there a process you go through to evaluate that risk? Uh, yes, there is. In fact, uh, I wrote a book about taking risk. It's called Take the Risk because no one has ever accomplished anything by just sitting under the olive tree waiting for stuff to happen. You have to go out there uh, and you have to push the envelope. You have to do things uh, that are different uh, if you want to accomplish stuff. I remember when I was a young attending uh, neurosurgeon, uh, there was one problem that was very bothersome and it was achondroplast, the dwarfs. Uh, about 7% of the babies just died suddenly. And the reason they would die suddenly is because uh, when they're born, the hole at the base of their skull, out of which the spinal cord and the brain stem go, is very, very small. And it's putting pressure on the brain stem, um, particularly the part that controls your breathing. And they would just go to sleep at nighttime sometimes and die. And neurosurgeons would sometimes try to do an operation where they opened that area up to make more space, but the operation frequently made them worse or killed them because there just was no space there. So uh, we started uh, advocating a new procedure in which we didn't put instruments down into the space because there was no room there. Instead, we used these very high-speed diamond drills, and you would just drill the bone away, layer by layer until it was real thin, just like a potato chip. And then you would just flick it off. And that would allow the area to expand without ever putting any pressure in it. And when I first talked about that at a conference in Rome, uh, it was the first international conference on human achondroplasia, the, the geneticists from all over the world, they were just so angry. And they were yelling at me and they said, you surgeons are the ones who kill these patients. Why don't you just leave them alone? Only 7% of them will die and the others will live. But when you guys start operating on them, more of them die. And you just need to leave them alone and go do something else. They were very unhappy with me. Uh, but I kept, I kept it up. And uh, when I came back to Hopkins, there were people who were in opposition 
and they were complaining to the departmental chairman and to the dean and president of the hospital and then to the state medical board. You know, this is unethical, what Carson is doing, and then to the AMA, the American Medical Association. Along about that time, you know, we had finished about 70 patients, and we revealed the data, showed what happened with those 70 patients. All 70 of them were doing great. Nobody had died. And you know what? That was the end of the controversy. Everybody said, okay. I'm not going to argue anymore. This is the white man to do it. And now it's the way it's done all over the world. But sometimes, you know, it requires pushing the envelope and, um, you know, taking a chance, taking a risk. And one of the things that I do is I ask four questions. I say, what's the best thing that happens if I do this? What's the worst thing that happens if I do this? What's the best thing that happens if I don't do this? What's the worst thing that happens if I don't do this? And by answering those four questions, you can very easily, in many cases, come to a good decision about whether you should or should not take the risk. Thank you, Believers Fellowship. Let's move on over to Whitewater Middle School again for your two questions. Uh, how many lives uh, have you saved? Uh, that's very, very hard to say, but I've operated in about 15,000 people. And uh, since I retired last June, you know, I've been traveling around the country doing a great deal of speaking. In fact, retirement's busier than it was before. But uh, one of the really cool things is I get to see a lot of my patients because I've operated on so many people doesn't matter which state I go to, there's going to be some of my patients there. And it's, uh, it's actually fun to see them. Uh, I remember a, a young man not too long ago in Tennessee, uh, very well dressed, uh, obviously successful businessman. And he came up to me and he said, you know what, I don't remember you, but my parents tell me when I was a little baby, you operated on me, you were the only one who would operate, everybody else said it was inoperable. I just want you to know how well I'm doing. I want you to see it. He was so proud of himself. And then I remember on my birthday last year, I was in Alabama speaking. And at the end, we were having questions and answers. And a lady way back in the back stood up. There were about 2,000 people there. And uh, she said, Dr. Carson, happy birthday. You know, 20 years ago, I gave birth to a little baby who had such severe deformities of the head. Everybody said, just let the baby die. There's no point doing anything. And you were the only one who would do anything. And I just want you to have this birthday cake that we made, and it's going to be presented by my 20-year-old daughter, who you say. And everybody was just so emotional. It was so great to see that. But. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many lives I've saved, but I can tell you it's one of the greatest joys to be able to intervene in somebody else's life by the grace of God and to make it better. What has been the toughest procedure you've done? Oh, there's been so many tough procedures. It's, it's, it's hard to even imagine which one was the toughest. Uh, all of the conjoined twin cases were extremely difficult. And the thing that makes them so difficult is the fact that you don't get to practice it very often. You know, they say practice makes perfect, where there aren't that many of those kinds of cases. So no one is ever going to have a huge number of them and, and be able to reach back on their experience to help them. Uh, so you have to do a lot of innovative thinking uh, in the process and it makes it very difficult. But I remember one particularly stressful case and uh, this young man had been hippolindal disease. It's a syndrome where tumors grow in various parts of the body, particularly in uh, difficult parts of the brain. And this young man had developed a tumor in his brain stem, an area that was considered inoperable. And the problem was that his wife 
was a nurse who worked on the neuro pediatric neurosurgery floor. And uh, none of the adult neurosurgeons would operate on him. And uh, so she said, you got to operate on him. I said, but I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. She says, well, he acts like a kid. So, uh, you know, I couldn't escape from her. She just kept after me until, you know, finally I was beaten down. I said, okay, well, I'll go talk to him. And, um, you know, I said, you know, there's no better than a 50-50 chance that you will survive an operation if we try to take this out of your brainstem. And he very maturely turned to me and he said, Doc, there's a 100% chance that I'll die if you don't take it out. I thought that was a pretty mature response. So I said, okay, we'll try it. And uh, I, there I was operating on him. He had all these abnormal blood vessels down there. It just looked like a terrible mess. But I finally found a little area that I could open up the brain stem and reach in with a little micro instrument and try to fill for a capsule and I started delivering the tumor, pulling it out bit by bit and then the evoked potentials went flat. Sort of like a, an EKG that shows the heart where we have something that shows brain impulses and it was beeping along with the five normal waves and then all of a sudden boom it was flat. And the anesthesiologist said, I told you this would happen. I told you you shouldn't have operated on them. You killed them. Well, I finished taking the tumor out, but the evoke potentials remained flat. We were very somber because we figured, you know, if he did wake up, he would just be a vegetable. But the very next morning, he was sitting up in the bed cracking jokes and doing just fine. So, you know, that was. That was that probably put several extra years on my life, and I've had some other cases like that. Uh, there's no question that they're very, very challenging uh, cases, but the more challenging it is, the greater the reward. Okay, thank you, Whitewater. Let's move to Walnut Creek Elementary School for your two questions, please. Okay. Um, how long did it take you to get out of med medical school? Uh, well, medical school, fortunately, is only four years. But uh, I remember when I was in high school, uh, and I would tell my classmates that I was going to be a doctor, and they would say, oh, no, it takes too long. You have to go to college for four years, and medical school for four years, and a year of internship, and several years of residency. They said, you'll be an old, old man by the time you finish. But a funny thing happened. When I finished, they were the same age as I was. So the time didn't stop for them just because they weren't putting it to good use. And that's what you have to remember. Uh, you know, at your age, you got your whole life in front of you. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, it takes two or three or four years or it takes eight or ten or twelve years. You've got the time. So don't let that stop you in terms of deciding what kind of career you want to have. And it doesn't matter whether you're you know a girl or a boy. You know, don't let anybody define you. Don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot do and uh, tell you how much time and how much energy and how much effort and how much money you know, all of those things are peripheral issues. What's important is that you have right there between your ears this incredible brain. Your brain has billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections. It remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, it can process more than two million bits of information in one second. Think about that. And look, at, look around you. Look at all your classmates. They all have two eyes and two ears and a nose and a mouth. And yet, when you look at them, you can tell the difference between them. 
you could tell the difference between a thousand people, a million people, a billion people. Just little subtle differences, you can tell the difference. Your brain is that able to distinguish things. And some people say, don't learn this or don't learn that because you'll overload your brain. Take it from me, a neuroscientist, you cannot overload the human brain. If you learned one new fact every second, it would take you more than three million years to overload your brain. So since nobody lives for three million years, you don't ever have to worry about that. You can learn everything there is to learn and time is on your side. Did you ever think you would make it this far? Well, there have been a lot of surprises in my life. And uh, sometimes think things take unusual turns. And really the key is to do your best. Whatever the opportunity is that's presented to you, make the best of it. Make sure that you don't make excuses. Take responsibility and do it very well. Now that doesn't mean that you won't have problems. It doesn't mean that there won't be people who oppose you. There are always people who oppose you, particularly if you're doing something good. I, I can guarantee you, if you're making a difference, people will oppose you. If, you're, if everybody loves you all the time, you probably aren't ever saying anything or doing anything. But you have to understand who you are, what your goals are, what needs to be accomplished. And you know, you leave the rest of it up to God. Uh, my medical career, if somebody had sat me down in front of a computer and said at the beginning of my career, I want you to type out what you want your career to be. Anything you type there, that's what it'll be. You know, most people say, wow, that's fantastic. Well, I gotta tell you, I could not have come up with a better scenario than what actually happened. It just turned out so incredibly well. And uh, even since I've retired, amazing things are happening. And it's the same principle. It really doesn't matter whether you go into medicine or law or engineering, you may become an astrophysicist. But make sure that you do the very best you can with every opportunity that you have and it will be amazing what will happen in your life. Thank you, Walnut Creek. Let's move on to St. Killian for your two questions. Hi, my name is Nick from St. Killian. And my question is, what was your relationship with your brother like? Okay, well, I just talked to my brother yesterday. Um, we have a very good relationship. Uh, we had to have a good relationship because, you know, my mother was never home. We were what we call, what we call latchkey kids. Because my mother worked two to three jobs at a time. She would leave at five in the morning and get back after midnight. So we wouldn't see her in the morning or in the evening because we'd be in bed. We would sometimes only see her on the weekends and she would leave notes what we were supposed to do. And uh, so my brother and I basically had to take care of each other. Uh, so we were, we were pals, we hung out uh, and we looked out for each other. Now my brother was also an inspiration for me because uh, he started doing better in school before I did and uh, I noticed that and it had an impact on me. And then when we were in high school, my brother joined the ROTC and he rose to the rank of captain and became what's called a company commander. He had a lot of ribbons and medals and. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. So I joined ROTC too. Uh, I joined late, uh, so I was missing a semester, but I was 
I was so inspired and I was so determined and I worked really, really hard. And I became the com not only the company commander at the school, I became the city executive officer over all the schools in Detroit, a full colonel, the highest rank you could get. And I got to meet General Westmoreland, who at that time was in charge of the Vietnam War. And I got to go to Congressional Medal Honor Dinners and was offered a full scholarship to West Point. But all of that was initially inspired by my brother. And then he went on to become a rocket scientist. He works for Parker Aviation now. And I went on to become the brain surgeon. And what that tells you is that even though we live in this horrible environment, having a mother who did not accept excuses, who refused to be dependent, and who didn't accept excuses from us, made all the difference in the world. And it will make all the difference in your life as well. So yeah, I still have a, a very good relationship with my brother. He's a terrific uh, man. He has uh, daughters and I have sons. I have three sons, he has two daughters. Um, and one of them's in law school now. And uh, one of them was a chemist, but recently decided to open her own fitness center. And uh, it's, uh, as I was telling you before, a lot of times people have more than one career. So she started out her career as a chemist, and now she's opening a fitness center. Who knows what else will come along after that. Hi, my name is Andrea from St. Killian. My question is, who was your biggest inspiration when you were growing up? Biggest inspiration growing up? Boy, I had a lot of inspirations. I would have to say my mother, uh, who was one of 24 children and got married at age 13 and then found out uh, subsequently that her husband was a bigamist, had another family. She never gave up. Uh, she never became a victim and said, poor me. She always said, there's something that I can do. And even though we didn't have any money, she knew how to stretch every dime. She would go to the Goodwill and buy a shirt that had a big hole in the elbow. And she'd buy a patch and put a patch on it. Then she'd buy a patch and put it on the other elbow. And people would say, wow, that's a nice shirt. Where'd you get that? And she would take us out in the country on a Sunday morning, knock on a farmer's door, say, can we pick four bushels of your corn or beans or apples? Three for you and one for us. Well, the farmers always like that deal. And then she'd bring the stuff home and can it. And you know, she just knew how to, how to stretch things that way and, and not to be a victim, no matter what was going on around her. And then you know, there were other people that I didn't know personally that were big role models for me, like, like Booker T. Washington. He wrote the book called Up From Slavery. He was born a slave. And it was illegal for slaves to read. And yet, he taught himself to read. And he read everything he could get his hands on. And he became so knowledgeable that he became an advisor to two United States presidents. And that had a huge impact on me. And then I read the story of Joseph in the Bible. And that had a huge impact on me because he was sold into slavery by his own brothers. And he didn't say, bummer, my own brothers sold me into slavery. No, he said, if I'm gonna be a slave, I'll be the best slave there is. And he ends up being in charge of Potiphar's household, the captain of the Egyptian guard. And then Potiphar's wife sees him and you know starts trying to tempt him because she thinks he's cute. And uh, he does not yield to her temptation. He gets wound up being thrown into prison. She lied about him. And of course, her husband didn't believe her because he would have had Joseph executed, but he had to save face for his wife. So he winds up in prison. He doesn't say, bummer. Here I am living up to all the principles and standards and values that I know. And what happens? I wind up in jail 
and become bitter? No, he didn't say that. He says, if I'm going to be a prisoner, I'll be the best prisoner there is. He winds up with a very responsible position in the prison, ends up interpreting dreams, ends up as the governor of Egypt, which was the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And the moral of the story was, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It matters how you react to them. And, uh, you know, that gave me a lot of encouragement. When I looked around me and I saw broken windows and boarded up doors and violence and gangs and murders, and both of my older cousins were killed, you know, I could have started feeling sorry for myself. But those role models, those stories made me keep going. Thank you, St. Killians. Let's go to uh, Believer's Fellowship for the last two questions. What is your most fascinating part of the brain? The most fascinating part of the brain? Well, the brain has so many fascinating parts. As I said before, it has billions and billions of cells. One of the th reasons that I, I love pediatric neurosurgery is because the cells have the ability to change, something we call neuroplasticity. And that's why w when we do an operation like a hemispherectomy on a child, where we take out half of the brain, the other half can learn the functions of the part that was taken out and can help take over those kinds of functions. I remember there was a little girl from Connecticut, uh, eight years old, she was swinging in the schoolyard, fell off the swing and hit her head and had a seizure. And nobody got that excited. They said, it's just a post-traumatic seizure. It happens all the time. But the next week, she had two seizures. And the next week, three seizures. And then three every day. And then 10 a day, 30 a day, 60 a day. Despite all the medications the doctors were giving her, and they didn't know what to do. So they sent her to the doctors in New York. They didn't know what to do. And they sent her to the doctors in Boston. And they didn't know what to do, but there was an old doctor there. And he said, she reminds me of somebody with Rasmussen's encephalitis. And he told the parents, with that disease, the seizures get worse and worse no matter what you do. And eventually, you'll have to put her in an institution. And eventually, she'll die. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. Well, they were devastated. Their beautiful, precious little girl, nothing anybody could do. But the mother would never give up. And she went to the library. And she read everything she could read about epilepsy and encephalitis. And she discovered some of the work we were doing at Johns Hopkins with hemispherectomies. And they brought her down for an evaluation. My colleagues and I felt that she was a good candidate for that operation. And when I explained to the parents the risk of surgery that she might not be able to speak, she might be paralyzed on one side, she might be in a coma or she might die, they said, thank you, doctor, but no thank you. We couldn't live with ourselves if she was in a coma or she died and we never had a chance to say goodbye. So they took their little girl, seizures and all, back to Connecticut. And that Christmas, she was in a play. And while she was on stage, she had a grandma seizure. Arms and legs jerking, eyes rolled back, foaming at the mouth, incontinent of urine. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. They brought her back, they won the operation. I performed the operation, took out the left half of her brain. Everything went well except for one thing. She didn't wake up. She stayed in a coma. The day went by, two days, three days, still in a coma. Every time I went in the room, the parents were there grieving about their decision. I really felt for them. And a week went by. She used to love Mr. Rogers. They would play tapes of Mr. Rogers singing, saying poetry. Didn't wake her up. Two weeks, still didn't wake her up. Three weeks went by. She was off the respirator, but still in a coma. Mr. Rogers heard about her. Came all the way to Baltimore with all of his puppets to her bedside to try to wake her up. Didn't wake her up. Four weeks went by, a whole month, still in a coma. It was 2 a.m. in the morning. Her dad was lying on a cot next to her bed, and she said, Daddy, my nose itches. 
He was so excited, he jumped up and he ran out in the hallway. She talked, she talked, only had on his underpants. Everybody came out to see what all the commotion was. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning of her recovery. In no time, she was walking, she was talking, she wasn't having seizures anymore. Now they were really worried because it was time for her to go back to school and she was missing the left half of her brain, the side that allows you to calculate. They said she'll never be able to do math. But she was so determined, she worked so hard. The next year, she had the highest math average in her class. And she did that with half of a brain. That's how fascinating the brain is. That's that plasticity that I was talking about. The whole brain is the most amazing organ system in the universe. Okay, Zoe. Thank you. Dealing with the issue of prejudice, do you see a solution and or response to it? Uh, I'll tell you my solution. My solution is to become a neurosurgeon. Uh, I was asked by an NPR, National Public Radio reporter. She said, Dr. Carson, I know you don't talk about race very often. Why is that? And I said, it's because I'm a neurosurgeon. She looked at me quizzically. What the heck does that have to do with it? That's what she was thinking. She didn't say that. But I could see what she was thinking. I said, you see, when I take someone to the operating room, and I cut the scalp and peel it down and take off the bone flap and open the dura. I am operating on the thing that makes that person who they are. The cover doesn't make them who they are. The brain makes them who they are. That's the solution when people begin to think deeply and not superficially. That will make the difference. So we have had some wonderful questions. I know we have the other site at uh, Nova Southeastern University. We have some lurkers, they're educators. Uh, Daryl Diamond, she's also on the board for the United States Distance Learning Association. Do you guys have a question on your end that you want to ask? I first want to tell you how delightful this whole conversation has been, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Uh, I want to commend you also for gathering the different schools together because we're here today to see how we can have different people around the globe participate in topics of conversation that are meaningful to them. And you've definitely demonstrated that this can be done seamlessly. And I want to also commend the students at the uh, multiple sites for their insightful questions. Uh, you really have made us all as educators very proud of you today as well. So thank you for letting us participate in this with you. Well, we're thankful that you all are interested in doing that. And you know, one of the things that's really wonderful, you know, we look at the statistics and we see how we're behind in science, math, and so many areas vis-a-vis -vis other places in the world. But one of the ways to fix that is through technology. We have advanced technology. We're going to be able to take the very best teachers and put them in front of a million students instead of 30 students. We're going to be able to use virtual classrooms to appeal to the interest of those kids whose brains are in fast motion because they spend all their time with video games. We're going to be able to take advantage of the way those things are done because, you know, we have to recognize that things are changing and we can't necessarily go back to the good old days, we have to adapt to what days that we have and use the technology and the information that we have to put ourselves where we should be, which is at the forefront and not at the tail. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Carson. We were just talking about you know, how many years we've been doing this and he's generously done this. This is year nine that he's connected every year for our students. Um, and he's connected all over the world. Uh, next year will be our 10th anniversary and we just like to give him a round of applause for taking the time out because we know he has a busy schedule to connect with the students and with uh, other people that are watching this event. So thank you very thank much. You. Pleasure. you can open up your mics.